This video was inspired because I believe William or Bill Powell was a greater influence on Hollywood than we realize. He was explored in the Star Sapphire and Palm Springs videos on this channel where his relationship with Marilyn Monroe was discussed, but he remains enigmatic. I consider him to be one of the few successful actor poets of Hollywood. Powell was born in Pittsburgh in 1892, the only child of Nettie Manila and Horatio Warren Powell, an accountant. In 1907, young William moved with his family to Kansas City, Missouri, where he graduated from Central High School four years later. His youth in Kansas City would influence the passions of the starlet Jean Harlow, who also lived in Kansas City years later. After high school, Powell enrolled at the University of Kansas to study law, inspired by his father, but after a week he relocated to New York City, where he attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and was supported by his aunt. In 1912, Powell left the AADA and began working in vaudeville and stock companies. He appeared over 200 times on stage. He began his Hollywood career in 1922, playing Professor Moriarty in a production of Sherlock Holmes with John Barrymore, the acclaimed actor. He performed as Francis I in When Knighthood Was in Flower with Marion Davies and the two remained friends. He remained under contract to Paramount throughout the 1920s before signing with Warner Brothers. In 1915, in Westchester, New York, Powell married Julia May Tierney, who was two years his junior. The two were in the same acting troupe, which Powell recalled when writing a summary of his career in 1935. Julia May Tierney was born in New York City, the daughter of Thomas Tierney and Mary Hyde Tierney. She changed her name to Eileen Wilson, and appeared in Broadway and touring shows, including Within the Law, A King of Nowhere, The Love Drive, In for the Night, No More Blondes, The Lady of the Lamp, East is West, Partners Again, The Night Duel, The Little Spitfire, Burlesque, and Peter Flies High from 1913 to 1931. The Powell separated soon after their son's birth in 1925 and finally divorced in 1930. Eileen stopped acting in 1931, and I believe she may have lived off of alimony from her divorce after that. Their son, William David Powell, was conceived during one of their few reconciliations. Eileen died in 1942 before her son and ex-husband, aged 48 years in New York City. Her tombstone reads, Until the day break and the shadows flee away which I thought was very poetic and comes from the Song of Solomon in the Bible. Powell portrayed a vengeful film director in the silent movie The Last Command and was typecast as a villain. His first starring role was Philo Vance in The Canary Murder Case of 1929 with Louise Brooks and would start a long career of Powell as detectives. Unlike Louise, who refused to record her voice in a statement of defiance to the wicked and greedy Hollywood system, Powell recorded his voice for 10 grand at the time. His voice is a rich baritone, and I don't believe it has ever found its equal in Hollywood. By 1930, William Powell was 38 and doing quite nicely professionally. Thanks to his fruity voice and training in the legitimate theater, he'd made a smooth transition from silence to talking pictures and was top man at Paramount. But on a personal level, he'd been separated for many years from his wife and was still living with his parents in Hollywood. He was also keeping a bachelor pad in the name of Mr. Thorne, which was kitted out with an extensive collection of appalling French photographs, which are lost today. Powell and his friends Ronald Coleman, Richard Bartholmus, Ernest Torrance, and Warner Baxter were well known in 1920s Hollywood as being a set of disgraceful bachelors, although they were calming down as they hurtled towards their 40s, and certainly weren't on the same booze and birds fueled level as Errol Flynn. However, when Powell went traveling around Europe with Ronnie and Ernest in 1930, he noted that he was absolutely surrounded by playboys and playgirls of the play world. Everyone around him seemed to be having a most glorious time. Yet he was, if possible, even more lonely than he had been at home. 
This would be a great inspiration for him in the 1931 film Man of the World, co-starring Carol Lombard. Lombard was 21, 16 years Powell's junior, also living with her mother, but completely her own woman. Carol Lombard was the professional name she chose in 1925 when she was just 15 as Jane Peters was too dull. An interesting time because it was the same year Powell's son was born. After her car crash, which supposedly scarred her face when she was 17, Carol took the pragmatic step of signing up with Max Sennett as a bathing beauty to restart her career. When she ended up at Paramount after Pathé went bust, she hadn't yet found her voice in pictures and was still in the process of cultivating a strong on-screen persona. Man of the World is a potboiler melodrama about a blackmailer playboy who falls in love with one of his marks. The plan was for a professional discussion prior to the start of filming. William Powell was a successful leading man who had no time for dippy young actresses. Carol Lombard was a young, independent woman determined to succeed on her own merits and with blunt language dis demonstrated she wasn't taking anything from anyone. As neither party suffered fools gladly, it was thought best they meet beforehand by the studio and discuss the requirements for the picture. The day I met Carol, I had the same feeling as a 16-year-old boy on his first date. I was embarrassed and fidgety. I worried over whether or not I was making a good impression on her. It just so happened that immediately after our introduction, which took place at the studio, we were left alone to talk over the picture we were about to do together. But we didn't talk about the picture. We talked about men and women and things that happened to them and ourselves, William Powell remembered. The talk carried on into a long dinner date, and that was that. During the filming of Man of the World, they were described as being torridly fascinated with each other, and their chemistry radiates through the screen, cutting through a fun little picture. The fascination continued after Man of the World wrapped. They had a very similar sense of humor. Powell was well known for being a wind-up merchant, and he thought Carol's filthy jokes and potty mouth were hilarious. So Carol got stuck into some serious banter with her new boyfriend giving him the nickname Junior, no doubt due to his age. And the, in the meantime, and in order to capitalize on their romance, Paramount put them together in another picture, Ladies' Man, another enjoyable potboiler, although the couple were able to project strong emotions in this film. Both parties were in hugely different places in their lives. Carol came crashing into Bill's neat and tidy existence as a humongous party animal, owning the dance floor at the Coconut Grove most weekends, and both were very definite about how they saw life panning out for them. Powell said that Carol was the frankest girl he'd ever met. Carol said that her boyfriend will strangle me, or at least want to. He likes order and dignity. I can't live that way. I always do whatever occurs to me at the moment. Bill was throwing caution to the wind, though, working his smooth patter on Carol to the max because during their first date, he had a revelation. Suddenly, in the midst of this talk with the most beautiful girl I had ever known, a thought came to me. Someday, I am going to ask this girl to marry me. Powell was called Bill by his friends, and so I will refer to him as Bill or Powell. But for that to happen, both parties would have to wind their necks in quite substantially. Bill wanted Carol to jack in her career, and there was no chance of that, and Carol wanted to hit the night spots, and there was no chance of the bookish Bill doing that. I think I asked Carol to marry me on average of every half hour. At first, she was a bit dubious. So many professional marriages failed to work out. I had experienced one failure in matrimony previously, and Carol was just starting out on a career that was tremendously important to her. So they tried to compromise. Bill and Carol married on June 26, 1931, pretty much as soon as his divorce was finalized. She chose not to wear a traditional white wedding dress. She wore a blue afternoon gown and Bill's wedding gift, a perfect platter of a pin composed of two star sapphires surrounded by diamonds. It would protect her from a machine gun in a frontline trench in any old war, motion picture from December 1931 wrote. The sapphires, by the way, match the color of Carol's eyes. Maybe you think that didn't occur to Bill Powell. As far as he was concerned, freedom is one of the great disillusions of the world. I've had a great many years of the coveted freedom. I think I'm getting the most wonderful girl in the world, 
freedom, I'd trade every bit of it just for a few hours with Carol. And Bill was so nervous he forgot which finger to put the ring on. With that, the pals went off to Hawaii for two weeks of sun and fun and relaxation, except that it wasn't because Carol ended up with the flu. And so the pals tried to settle into their new life together in their new home, Bill trying his best to make his wife happy by trying to support her career, and Carol trying her best to make her husband happy by trying to be the perfect housewife. Carol explained to Garson Kaneen years later, you know how it is, you always try to get in solid with the son of a bitch by playing him at his game. Now with Philo, it was different because after all, Philo, it was legitimate, we were married. Philo was her name for William Powell because he had once played the detective Philo Bance in his first starring role. With him, it was wife stuff. That's where I learned how to put a house together and have everything supplied and how to take care of his clothes and what had to be dry cleaned and what not. The Powell Lombard house on 6861 Iris Circle still stands today. I mean, I was the best fucking wife you ever saw. I mean, a ladylike wife, because that's how Philo wanted it. There are many recollections of Powell's book collection in that home. It was during this time that Carol appeared in No Man of Her Own, a film that has become a legend amongst Lombard and Clark Gable fans due to the many hot love scenes she shared with future boyfriend Clark Gable. Despite the fact that she was still in love with Powell and Gable was married to Rhea Langham, but actually in love with Elizabeth Allen, the film remains a steamy one. No Man of Her Own may have been one of the catalysts for the strengthening of the production code due to those hot love scenes. The film attracted the wrath of Father Daniel Lord, who asked how William Powell could countenance his wife appearing in filthy movies. After two years of marriage, Bill and Carol called it a draw. Although it was done with best intentions, their attempts to give the other what they wanted were stifling. Gossip columnist Adele St. John Rogers wrote soon after Carol Lombard's death, she moved fast and saved much. Once she saw that there were deep and fundamental differences between herself and Bill as husband and wife, which would degenerate into quarrels, into ugliness, she didn't wait for any of the messy, cruel things which are called grounds for divorce to happen. She used the surgeon's knife swiftly, cleanly, with decision. Weeping as though her heart would break, she put her arms around him and said goodbye to him as a husband, but she saved him as the best friend any woman ever had. The age difference proved to be a lot, and bookish Bill just couldn't connect with the excitable Lombard on some occasions. Carol headed off to Nevada for the proceedings. Bill didn't contest the petition, and Carol didn't want any money from him. In fact, the proceedings contained evidence that this was not going to be your usual unpleasant Hollywood split, such as the pairs and jokes. For example, Carol cites William Powell's constant use of foul language as one reason for the dissolution of the marriage, causing ironic laughter in the courtroom. Carol breezed into town from Reno with the divorce papers in her bag and the loveliest tan. Hello, Bill, said Carol over her mother's phone. Baby's back. Darling, exclaimed Mr. Powell, looking smart in a snappy dressing robe. Powell would state decades later that he cared nothing for clothes and preferred to walk around his house naked, occasionally putting on a robe. He also preferred a huge bed, seven feet wide, and triangular pillows. Darling, I've missed you so. Not a good laugh in weeks. Come right on over. I'll start icing the champagne. Carol said, I admire him as an actor and as a man. I know that we are vital to each other. We have a mental balance founded on respect. We meet on a friendly basis, and when you speak of friendship after marriage, know that it is possible only when there has been no quarreling. Respect dies with quarreling and fighting. I think it is fine when two persons who have separated can meet as friends and go out together with no feeling of bitterness. I must like the man, or I wouldn't have married him in the first place. Carol Lombard is often pictured wearing her 152 brooch and star sapphire ring. Photos of her feature the 152 carat sapphire brooch she gave herself after she sold the 80 carat one gifted to her by her first husband, William Powell. This continues to be a mystery because Powell supposedly gave her two star sapphire rings, and so maybe one was 152 carats and the other one was 80. Either way, this is explored at length in my video on the star sapphire rings. 
Evidently, Bill Powell feels better when his girlfriends wear sapphires. When wed to Carol Lombard, he gave her a colossal one set in a ring. Now, thanks to Willie, Jean Harlow owns the largest star sapphire in the movie colony, 152 carats, according to the Australian Woman's Weekly from February 1937. Some of the most famous star sapphire jewelry of the golden age of Hollywood, the 1930s, is the jewelry given to Carol Lombard and especially that given to Jean Harlow by actor William Powell. Side note, Asta, the dog in the Thin Man movies, which would make Powell and his co-star Myrna Loy household names, was a wire fox terrier whose real name was Skippy. He appeared in other hit movies, such as The Awful Truth with Cary Grant and A Short-Haired Black Cat, and Bringing Up Baby with Cary Grant, Katherine Hepburn, and A Real Life Leopard. Powell was known for maintaining good relationships with girlfriends and wives. He was also a pessimist, certainly a warrior. In November 1931, Warner Brothers gave Powell a questionnaire to fill out for newspapers and movie magazines. They printed questions followed by Powell's answers. We're told that he used his very own portable typewriter. His eyes are blue, hair dark brown, height six feet. What was your ambition during your school days? Mr. Powell's reply was, she had curls. What, has, what does he do to keep fit? I have a swimming pool. Every day I go up to it and I give it a long, piercing look. I think a lot about tennis and talk a very good game of golf. I worry about almost anything, a very fine worrier in fact. This makes me lose weight and I am fittest when I am lean, so there you are. Favorite outdoor sport? Tennis. Favorite indoor game? Bridge. His hobbies? Carol Lombard, who was none other than Mrs. Powell at the time. A similar type of article from 1936 tells us that although he's supposed to be one of the screen's best dressed men, he doesn't know much about fashion. He likes plenty of room so he can turn in all directions, including in his extra wide bed. He's proud to be an actor. His one big secret is that his middle name is Horatio. In 1934, the publicity department was talking about William Powell as being a new star in the MGM sky, despite having at least a decade of acting under his belt and transitioning, transitioning successfully from silent film. So he had this ability to be behind the curtain. In December 1933, newspapers reported Carol Lombard still wears the engagement ring given to her by William Powell and prizes it very highly. Show Carol Lombard a star sapphire and immediately she goes stark, staring, screaming, mad, and there's really nothing to be done about it until she buys that star sapphire. You'll die in the poorhouse, shrieks Field C, her personal assistant and best friend. Yes, says Carol, but isn't it beautiful? Another article from the same issue of Screenland magazine talks about William Powell's new house, where he's got every gadget known to man. The property of William Powell and Carol Lombard is extremely interesting. I believe one of their houses was converted into apartments, and so their pool was cut, and you can see that in some images, but because of the way the landscape changed, it is sort of difficult to match these old photos of homes to um, what may remain today. So it is very interesting, the fact that the two had a, had a uh, real estate portfolio. Fieldsy was Madeline Field, a former Senate girl bathing beauty. She later married director Walter Lang. 1936 was a professional triumph for William Powell. He appeared in five of the biggest and most critically applauded movies of the year, Libeled Lady with Jean Harlow, The Great Siegfeld, After the Thin Man, The Ex Mrs. Bradford, and arguably the greatest screwball comedy ever made, My Man Godfrey. There is a story that Powell insisted on Lombard, his ex-wife, for the role, and Lombard insisted on Powell, hit her ex-husband, for the role. Either way, the two are magic on screen together. Bill saw reversed parallels between how they would got together with the character's pursuit of each other and his anointing Carol as his protege. Bill's mentor during his early years on the stage, Leo Dietrichstein, taught Bill to use his own personal experiences to motivate his performances, advice that Bill then passed on to Carol. Allied to this director, Gregory LeCava had the cast improvise the scene. An outline script was brought to the set of My Man Godfrey every day, and the cast would brainstorm the scene before filming. 
Bill was apparently nervous about this, but for Carol it was a throwback to her freewheeling Max Senate days. And it's this that makes the entire movie so funny but also poignant. In a notarized agreement dated August 17, 1933, detailing the conditions and terms of their divorce, there was a payment of 20 grand to Lombard from Powell, no alimony, and the transfer of a section of Beverly Hills real estate to Powell from Lombard. Together with a notarized decree of divorce by which the marriage was dissolved in August 1933, According to the document, which was auctioned by Bonhams, Lombard appeared in court, but Powell was represented by his attorney. Not uncommon in show business divorces, but it may show that Carol was far more eager than Powell for the divorce. If 1936 was William Powell's greatest year, 1937 and 1938 were marked by tragedy. Carol had suffered the tragic accidental death of her partner Russ Colombo in 1935, but Carol and Clark Day Gable were completely unprepared for what would happen to Jean Harlow. William Powell was the love of Jean Harlow's life, but he was ambivalent about Jean throughout their relationship, stringing her along for three years without the marriage she longed for. She called him Poppy, again a nod to the age difference in the relationship. Jean frequently sought father figures in her relationships due to the fracture, fracturing between her controlling mother and father. Powell was also nervous about Jean's brush with catastrophe in the murder or suicide of her former husband, Paul Byrne. In Christmas 1936, actor William Powell gave Jean Harlow a ring with diamonds alongside a 152 carat star sapphire. It gave Harlow pleasure to know that Powell had given her the largest sapphire in Hollywood, larger than Carol Lombard's 80 carat. Sapphires went with Jean's blue eyes, but Powell would call the ring vulgar. You can see the pair on screen together in Live Old Lady, a film where Harlow loses Powell and they also have to fake and hide their relationship. After witnessing her awful death from kidney failure at the age of 26, he was filled with remorse but like all true friends, Carol dished out the hard truths, saying to her friend Kay Mulvey, I shall always consider Bill a friend, but even if I searched my mind from end to end, I would not be able to understand why he did what he did to Jean. Powell purchased the grave next to Jean Harlow's, intending to be buried next to Baby, which was Harlow's nickname, but he never was. Harlow's funeral is interesting because she was buried in pink, which according to her former secretary, she never wore. I don't know how much of an influence Harlow's mother had on the whole affair, as there are reports she pressured Powell to pay for an extravagant funeral with a marble tomb, and there are also reports Paul did it because he loved baby so much or felt guilty. After her funeral, where Powell is photographed barely able to stand up, he went on a cruise. He underwent experimental radiation treatment for colon cancer in 1938, which was completely successful after two years of treatment. He told an interviewer in 1963, I was one of the lucky ones. Given his own health and sorrow over Jean Harlow's death, he did not undertake any film roles for more than a year during this period. He struggled emotionally after Jean Harlow's death and Carol comforted him at the funeral. After escaping to Ronnie Coleman's yacht for a while, he collapsed during the filming of Double Wedding and had to take further time off. Carol rushed to support him, joining a very close group of friends who nursed him during his illness and radiation treatment. On the evening of January 16, 1942, William and his third wife, Diana Powell, were telephoned and informed that Carol was on board a plane which had crashed into mountains near Las Vegas. Bill and Diana waited up all night for news about their friend. Finally, they received confirmation that Carol had died in the disaster. Her best friend for over 10 years, William Powell, was devastated. On January 6, 1940, taking a step back, three weeks after they met, Powell married his third wife, actress Diana Lewis, who canceled her film career to be his full-time wife. They remained married until his death from pneumonia in 1984. Their marriage had to weather the suicide of Powell's only son. Powell was the only child of William Powell and actress Eileen Wilson. 
He graduated from Princeton, magna cum laude, in English. In December 1956, at the age of 31, Powell wed former child actress Patricia Parsons, who was born in 1931 and died in 2006, exchanging their wedding vows at the home of his father on Verita Norta in Palm Springs, California. This was the home of William Powell and Diana Powell. The wedding ceremony was performed by Judge Eugene Thierau with his father as best man and Parsons' sister, Mrs. Kenneth Zook, as matron of honor. The couple honeymooned in Las Vegas, Nevada. They divorced in September 1957 and had no children. Powell went on to become a television writer whose credits include episodes of Bonanza, Death Valley, 77 Sunset Strip, and Rawhide. He also worked as a story editor and coordinator, later an associate producer at Warner Brothers and Universal Studios, and held an executive position at NBC. In 1968, after suffering from depression, hepatitis, and kidney problems that had forced him to quit writing, he stabbed himself repeatedly in the upper body while in the shower and died. He left a four-page note addressed to his father, which has never been made public, to whom he was very close. The last two sentences were only those revealed to the public. Things aren't so good here. I'm going where it's better. Powell was buried at Cathedral City's Desert Memorial Park in Riverside County, California, where his father and his father's last wife, Diana Lewis, are also buried. Mr. William Powell was noted for his trim mustache, impeccable attire, and resonant voice. He was not handsome in the accepted Hollywood sense. His face was considered suited more to sinister than romantic roles, and throughout the silent film era, he invariably played cads and other villains, but he never changed his face. Sound movies projected his polished charm and wit, making him a highly paid hero and leading box office star for more than two decades. He had a meticulous sense of timing and rehearsed his roles at home, reading his lines aloud to himself. When he reached stardom, he also helped polish his scripts. He injected subtle comic qualities into his characterizations, transforming even scoundrels into plausible and even somewhat humane, sympathetic characters, no matter how menacing their actions could be. An interviewer reported in 1949 that Mr. Powell spent most of the time on a set deleting his dialogue, preferring a gesture to a page of conversation. It's easier, he remarked. His quip belied his serious view of his craft. In an earlier interview, he was asked how he kept trim. I highly recommend worrying, he replied. It is much more effective than dieting. The actor sought for years to play the individualistic 1880s patriarch in Life with Father, and reviewers acclaimed it as his finest performance, along with Zetsu Pitts, who you can learn about on my channel, and Elizabeth Taylor. Off camera, the actor was known to acquaintances as reserved and businesslike, and to intimates as a wry eccentric who savored practical jokes. Cultivate solitude and quiet and a few sincere friends, he said, rather than mob merriment, noise, and thousands of nodding acquaintances. The nearly six-foot-tall actor came to dislike being described as suave and sophisticated. Although he was once called one of Hollywood's best-dressed men, he paid little attention to clothes. His later roles were again character types, and he won particular praise for his final performance, that of a bored Navy ship's director in the 1955 comedy Mr. Roberts. In the mid-1950s, he retired to Palm Springs, California, to play golf, oversee investments, and lead a leisurely life with his wife in their desert sanctuary. Diana was interviewed later in life, and you can listen to some of those interviews on YouTube. Ambling up the driveway toward the house at 383 West Verita Norte was a strange-looking man in tennis shoes holding a cardboard shirt box. His presence alarmed the housekeeper, who ran to Mrs. William Powell, Diana Lewis, to alert her to the intruder. Lewis had to laugh as she instantly understood the visitor was none other than her friend Howard Hughes, the eccentric millionaire businessman, movie producer, and pilot. Welcoming him inside, she ascertained he had dropped by for breakfast on his way to New York. 
She knew Hughes to be a prodigious eater and instructed her Swedish cook accordingly. As she would remember years later, Hughes ate a hundred pancakes, an entire package of bacon, and four cups of coffee, a true Texan-sized breakfast, then was on his way. Such was the interesting Palm Springs life of Lewis, known as Mousy, after her movie star husband dubbed her a little mouse on their first date. She was tiny in stature, barely five feet tall, but she had Goliath energies and enthusiasm. Ruth Waterbury, writing for Photo Play magazine at the time, recounted the story the studio concocted about the couple's meeting. William Powell's elopement with Diana Lewis was the last thing Hollywood expected, but then few knew the romantic truth behind it. It was, of course, sheer fate that sent young, beautiful, tiny Diana Lewis to tall William Powell's swimming pool to make publicity pictures. She might just as well have been taken to any one of a dozen other Metro Stars pools, and Bill might just as well not have been at home. In fact, the studio thought he was away, but he wasn't. And it happened that one late winter afternoon, he looked out into his garden and saw the vivid, unsophisticated girl standing there laughing in the sun. She had been first introduced to her soon-to-be husband at an MGM luncheon for dignitaries. Years later, she realized she'd been seated near Harry Truman a decade before he became president, but hadn't known it. Powell was entranced by the little starlet and arranged to meet her under the guise of a publicity photo shoot. Lewis had already appeared in multiple films alongside Mickey Rooney, a very big star in the 1930s. Powell had achieved fame playing in the Thin Man detective movies as well as in the Philo Vance detective series. In December 1939, just after the photo shoot, the couple spent the weekend at the Desert Inn, where Powell proposed to Lewis. Only three weeks later, they eloped and were married in a grove of trees on the Hidden Well Ranch near Las Vegas just after the new year in 1940. Hollywood was not amused. The announcement that 21-year-old Diana Lewis was the third Mrs. William Powell knocked Hollywood silly. The wise crowd was offended because it had all been on the wrong Powell trail. You could, until January 5th, take your choice of Powell romantic rumors. There was Bill's supposed rekindling of the flirtation he had started several years ago with Ginger Rogers, his supposed current infatuation with Loretta Young, and his inability ever to fall in a love again because of Jean Harlow. Hollywood hating nothing quite so much as being caught with its rumors down, wailed several assorted moans to high heaven. The couple almost immediately decamped to Palm Springs and would live in the desert for the rest of their lives. Buying a little cottage in Lost Palms on Verita Norte, which still stands today, at the recommendation of their friend, neighbor, and movie star Adolf Menju in 1941, they quickly became integrated into the community. Unlike Lombard, Le Lewis settled in quickly as Mrs. Powell, giving up her movie career entirely and plunging into life in Palm Springs and at the Palm Springs Racquet Club. She would be the unofficial queen of the desert, social hostess, and chief philanthropist for the next 50 years. When asked why he seldom left the desert at all and almost never visited New York City again, Powell quipped, why would I? Everyone I know comes here sooner or later. It certainly helped that the Palm Springs Racquet Club became a Hollywood club and had mob connections for years. Palm Springs during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s was populated by the Hollywood set, captains of industry, and socially prominent citizens from across the country. Mousy and William Powell were in the mix through it all. And you can learn more about their hub, the Palm Springs Racquet Club, in the video on my channel. The Powells were happily married, living in Palm Springs for 44 years until Powell's death in 1984. Presiding over the town for more than another decade, Mousy remained desert royalty until her death in 1997. Both are buried in Desert Memorial Park down the way from several of their other famous friends.